the bone so she can bark. I might have to go give her another bone. <laughs> so what I'd love to do, first of all, how many of you um, received the second packet? There was a typo in the first, great. And um, I don't know if I'll get through all of it, not sure, uh, but I like to have a little bit more. I, what, I'm hopeful that we'll get through much of it and just be able to use the very last text as homework or reading between this week and next week. So here's the big question. Has anyone here besides Neil Litz studied uh, either Mishnah or Tal Talmud? Fran has. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I am gonna, if, it, if it's a little too easy for some folks, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna start more at the beginning because I think this is so crucial to understanding rabbinic Jewish life. Um, and what I have for you tonight is a question because Jews ask questions. And then we're gonna spend maybe 15 minutes or so on some terminology and dates on, on history. Because when you study at the Jewish Logical Seminary, one of the things we learn is that you cannot study without understanding the relationship of time and when a specific rabbi is speaking, what generation. Um, and we actually, so we, we actually try to figure out which rabbi is speaking in what generation because they are actually speaking across each other. I wanna welcome Lee who just joined us who is a congregant from my former school but actually lives in North Jersey. Um, so I got to do her wedding a couple years ago, very exciting. And, um, and I wanna welcome everyone else here. So let's start with a bracha. Actually, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Hold on one second. So it's the bracha of la asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, uh, uh, sovereign of all, uh, who commands us to be busy with, to be involved with divrei Torah, words and actions of Torah. So um, I like to do it in a song form. I learned this song from Cantor Ari Priven, who is the cantor at uh, BJ in New York. If you've ever been to BJ, I worked for him and he taught us always to, you know, do our brachot in song. So join with me. And if you don't know it this time, you'll know it next time. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lasok b'divrei Torah lasok b'divrei Torah Amen. So I have a question. What is the number one song in the, wait, somebody highlighted me and I wanna see everyone. So let me put you back in gallery. Good. What's the number one? Oh, by the way, I plan to go till about eight because that's enough time to be on, on um, Zoom. Uh, Zoom. However, we will have breakout rooms um, and a time to be putting answers into the chat. But there will be breakout rooms that you'll go into at one or two points during the evening. Uh, don't be scared, it'll be fun. Name, we're playing, uh, we're having a sing down right now. Anyone ever have a sing down? By the way, you shouldn't play sing down with me because I win. But what is a song that you know that has the word Mishnah in it? Thank you. Who said that? Leslie. Leslie. Hello, Leslie. So you read ahead, right? Mm -hmm. Or you saw, or you know it, but at the very top of the sheets, do you have the sheets that I sent and are, are they either printed out or you have them on it? Great. So the words are, Leslie, you want to sing us the words or can some, will someone sing us the line in Echad Miodea, the Passover song, Who Knows One? Or you could look at the sheets if anyone wants to jump in and sing it. Awesome. So 
Um, yes, I will let Suzanne know when the rooms are. They are much later. They are after when we get to the first study piece there, I think, which I think is numbered four. So when you get to the Passover Seder and you're singing Echad Mi Odea and you sing Chamisha Chum Torah, five are the books of the, shout it out. Torah. You can unmute everyone. We're not singing, unmute. Torah. Five Torah. are the books of the Torah. Shisha Sidre Mishnah. <laughs> Things are the book of the Mishnah. Six are the orders yeah, of the Mishnah. It doesn't say books, it says say there. Orders. And, and, right. Order of Mishnah. Order. Order of Mishnah, right. And so that's kind of confusing, especially because you're singing that sitting at a Seder. Seder. <laughs> so it's the same word with radically different usage. In this, Seder is an organized way to hold other books. So I try to think of it today as, remember when you used to have a disc and you used to have your computer stuff on a disc? Either it was a small one or a floppy disc. But on every disc, I'm sure, by the way, 100 years ago, this is not how they were teaching Mishnah. Yeah. On every disc, you have files. And each file is its own discrete work. So that's what a Seder is like a file. And within a Seder, within an order, there are lots of books. We're going to go over what they are a little bit later. So if we, if does everyone have access or Suzanne, could you put the sheet in the chat for people who don't have it? Okay, so I am going down to where it says terms, time period, important history. Um, but first we're going to do dealer's choice, meaning I'm going to, before we go over what the, what the stuff is, people want to tell me what you guys know. Anyone want to jump in what you know about the Mishnah besides that it has six orders to it? Fran. Um, what I've learned um, is, recently is that uh, many of the books uh, in the Mishnah are Halakha um, and Perkei Avot, which I'm studying in detail right now, is the ethics, more focused on ethics, the wisdom of the sages. That's Great. all I know. Mm -hmm. That's, anyone want to add to that? We're adding to our base of knowledge. Um, CLEs. Yeah. What did you say? I couldn't hear who was that was. No. Oh, it, Jane. It, Jane oh, and then Janet. It, well, I I'm not sure this is right, but it's the rabbinic okay. period is was a response to the fact that the temple got destroyed. It's a hundred percent right. And but there but there's a and there were other things too like um, I guess the Sadducees and there were all these sects and that Christianity was actually one of those sects and so one of the responses was um, was the I guess the rabbinic discussion but there's a big gap there before it gets written down because it's 200 years right we're gonna go over it's actually 130 130 years but we're gonna go over you you it was perfect janet you want to add to our corpus of knowledge is it some of is it the initial codification of the torah shabal peh it's exactly what it is but you used code so some people don't know what that is so let's unpack your torah shabal peh yeah, so the, the uh, oral tradition of the Torah. Yes, so there is both the written Torah with we know as the first five books and then rabbinic Judaism, classical rabbinic Judaism, though not me or anyone else probably that teaches you here or most places believes what I'm about to say. The ancient rabbis and many ultra Orthodox Jews today, Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, believe that the Torah Shabal Peh, the oral Torah was given in those exact words by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. And that our job is just to, in the generations under, uncover the commentary that was given. I think most people on this Zoom would go with the historical school and say, no, this is a document that was written in response to historical events. So we're gonna talk about what some of those events are. So I'm going through the actual now uh, terms, time period, important history, unless anyone has anything else they wanna add about Mishnah. Anyone study it in school, grammar school, whatever? Lee, you unmuted, go ahead. 
Yeah, um, I sort of always learned it as the Mishnah was kind of the headlines, and then the Talmud, the Gemara was all of the details in great detail. Okay, good. All of this is adding. It's all right, and it's all adding to our knowledge. Yeah, Neil? It was um, reputedly compiled by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Right, compiled in the year 200, maybe by Rabbi Judah the Prince in the north of Israel. Okay, so what we say about the Mishnah is that it is the first rabbinic book, the first major book that defines the rabbinic time period, which, as you'll see, started, as Jane correctly said, started before the temple was destroyed. And we're going to go through and look at actually, you have the dates, but just first. Legal scholars say that, the, any lawyers here? This is an apodictic text. This text gives you discrete laws, but, and, and a few stories. In fact, we'll get to one story tonight, hopefully, but it's not the back and forth stories of the Talmud. It's not the Talmud where, you know, we answer a question with a question and then we divert for three pages and then we get back to the main topic. The Mishnah is quite precise and short sayings of Jewish practice. And I think that um, Jane said it right. The temple gets destroyed finally in, anyone remember what year? 70. 70 of the common era, right? Jews, we say no. common era, not the year of our Lord, not Anno Domino. Um, so 70 of the common era, but the scholars that make up the discussions that we'll read in the Mishnah lived a good 200 years before. Famous ones like Hillel, Akiva, and other names are earlier, and you'll, you'll find names that are later. But the temple gets destroyed, and there's a famous story about um, the, the rabbis who are on the Sanhedrin, on the great court in Jerusalem, being snuck, and it's actually in the Talmud to read these stories, snuck out of Jerusalem in coffins, and they're alive. And then they make a deal. They make a deal to be able to go to the north of Israel and to set up shop, and they end up setting up shop in a town called Yavna. You can go visit. Uh, it's still there. And that is why, I actually, the Mishnah is written in Hebrew. It's not written in modern Hebrew but it's similar to Hebrew. What Neil Litt studies on a Wednesday afternoon is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Aramaic, which is close, but no cigar. Not the same thing as uh, Mishnah Hebrew. It's the language that Jesus spoke and it's the language of the time, which is why when people say today, well, how can I study it in English? I'm like, well, they were studying it in their native language when they study in Aramaic. Okay, so Mishnah is the first rabbinic book uh, first rabbinic literature, and it gets edited, as we say, purportedly by that Rabbi Judah the Prince. We don't have indicators that it wasn't, and that's who we are told it's edited by, but it probably was by his school. It's a large work, so it probably wasn't just one guy. When we use the term Mishnah, we use it two ways. We use it as the Mishnah, which is all six orders, or we use a Mishnah. So I'm gonna study Mishnah or a Mishnah, or there is the Mishnah. That's how like the usage works. The Talmud, which hopefully we'll get to in a few weeks as an introduction, then you can go on to Neil's class during the day. The Talmud is the discussions that happen that are based on every Mishnah. So Mishnah is the first set of law that's given. The rabbis get it in the year 200, the north of Israel. And then for the next three or 350 years, rabbis in Three places, two places in, in Babylonia. I love these names, Sura and Pampadita in those two towns. And then also in Israel, discuss and come up with a Talmud. And so we have a Babylonian Talmud. That's the one that most people study. And then real scholars study the Jerusalem or Palestinian Talmud. But you gotta know Mishnah before you study Talmud. Or I think that like Mishnah is like the, the base before you go on to study Talmud. And you can also, if you study lots of Mishnah, you can get a lot under your belt to see what the rabbis thought and what their underlying values are, which is why I think it's, it's a great 
endeavor to learn Mishnah. What's a Tana besides the name of my dog? Everyone knows <laughs> that. My dog is called the Tana Kalba. My dog is named after a, a, a person, a speaker in the Mishnah. The first person to speak in any Mishnah is called the Tana Kama. Kama means first, right? And, and uh, Tana Kama, the first speaker, my dog is the dog, my dog's name, it means the dog is my teacher because Tana actually means teacher. Um, so <laughs> divide the rabbis who speak in my class tonight are all Tanaim from the Tanaitic period. And the rabbis who speak in Neil's class on the afternoon, if they're not speaking in the Mishnah, are later rabbis called Amoraim, later, later rabbis. So a Tana or Tanaim. You're a Tana if you're up to the year 200, and then you're an Amora. And that's important just because we want to, I want to know that we're talking across the generations. Okay, really two more important words, Chavruta. There's a great phrase in the Talmud, O Chavruta, anyone know? O Mituta. Oh, this is Aramaic. O Chavruta, O Mituta. Anyone know what it means? Either you have fellowship, you study in pairs, or death. Me too to me. What's the underlying value of that? What are some of the underlying values of that? Either you study with a study partner or it is death. Not to be alone. Not to be alone. Discussion. Discussion, yes. This text was not... Jews did not write this text to be silent. If you go into a traditional study house, it's loud. It's loud because people are studying back and forth and arguing, but arguing what we say, l'shem shamayim, for the sake of God. Okay, the last thing on your sheet that I wrote was Seder and order. I already explained that, six orders. Does anyone have any questions before we go and look at this page that says page, I even number the pages, page two. The Talmud Steinsaltz, 1989. Do you see that? I just had one little comment, which is the, but the idea that you, I can't see. Rob, Rob Goldston. Hi, if Rob. You, oh, thank you. Hi. If you're, uh, the statement is both that, that pairs, that being with someone, being in relation is crucial to study, but it's also saying that study itself is crucial to existence. Absolutely. So I'm sorry for missing that. And you are right. And, um, but expand on it more. Like, how do you see that? Well, it gives you life. It gives you it, the, the relationship. I mean, I, I very much like the Levinas's interpretation that the sort of fundamental idea behind Judaism is relationship. And right, so Levinas, French Jewish philosopher, last century. Go ahead. Right. You thought, what, well, last century, yeah, I guess. I know he was. He was 20th yeah. century. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, he thought he thought uh, where where um, uh, you know classical thought or essence precedes existence, and then uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the more modern philosophy is existence precedes essence. He says relationship precedes essence. That the the fundamental thing is about relationships, and, and that's and, right. And the first one would be a child to its mother. There's ways. Yes. Fair yeah. enough. But, but the, the general idea that, that you're developing a relationship with these rabbis, you're developing a relationship with the people you're talking with, and you're developing your relationship with Judaism, and that's what's giving you life, is a, is yes. a wonderful set of thoughts and, and feelings. And it's beautiful. And I feel that way when I'm studying Mishnah. So here's one other um, thing that we do when we study Mishnah or Talmud. It's for its own sake. We study lishma means for its own sake. I'm not, I don't know what the end is when I study. I know what Rob just said, that the end of me studying with someone is about building a relationship with God in the middle or in between us. Hmm. So it is the, just the, and we say, look, the act of study, I didn't put it in, but the world stands tonight, but in Pierre Cavo, the second mission of the world stands on three things. One of them is study. And the study is not, even though Fran just wrote me a note that um, there is something in Pierre about that you can study alone. It's just not the same. So 
Yeah, I wanna ask you to just pull up where it says the Talmud Steinsaltz reference in 1989. Um, anyone wanna share what they know about Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz? And if you don't, I will. So Rabbi Steinsaltz, a modern contemporary um, Israeli Orthodox rabbi. Rabbi Steinsaltz decided that in the modern state of Israel, everyone should learn Talmud. But most Israelis don't speak Aramaic because most Israelis are secular or at that time when he started. So he started a project many, many years ago where he translated the entire Talmud into Hebrew. <laughs> I mean, you think, right? Most of us think, oh, they're an Israeli, they can read it. No, no. Most of, so he translated the entire Talmud into Hebrew and what his school is doing right now is translating the entire Talmud into English, also into French, Spanish and Russian to make it more available to choose to be able to study. So this is from his reference guide in English. I sent it to you so that I, and you should print it out if you're gonna study. I just always find it important for me to be able to know who is speaking and when they are speaking. Also, how many of you are taking a trip to Jerusalem anytime in the next what, year or two? Because the names of all these guys are street names in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, which is very much, very fun. So if you look at this, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but this is for you to look at on your own maybe, um, but I'll go through it really briefly. You see the date, does everyone have the sheet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you can see that already in the third century, the land of Israel is being conquered by Alexander the Great. Things are changing. And that is when these two, we'll, we'll talk next week about pairs. I'm gonna give you terms each week, but next week, pairs, they often, people often have their pairs, their study partners who they argue with. By the way, when you are in school and doing Mishnah Talmud full time, you are taught to find someone with different skills than yourself. If you're good at grammar, they should be good at the big picture. Don't study with someone who has exactly the same skills. Study with someone who can add to you and challenge you. So Shimon HaTzadik is gonna be one of the earliest rabbis you hear, all the way down to Yehuda HaNasi. But you can see here rabbis that you know. So look in 30 BCE and tw to 20 CE. Who are the three great rabbis that you have heard of? Any, can you, anyone read them? Shammai. Yeah, Shammai and Hillel. And we Go know ahead. they disagree. What do we know about their disagreeing and about how they get along anyway? What do we know about them? They always disagree. They always disagreed. And we learn in the Talmud later, 500 years later, or 300 years later, that we rule by Hillel. Why do we rule by Hillel? The Talmud teaches because Hillel always taught his opponent's view. He would try to understand the other side. So we, we mostly always rule by him. And then you also of Haggadah fame, Rabban Gamliel. Yes, Michael Golden, Bible Babokir fame. We also know that after they argued, they would go and celebrate Shabbat dinner together, for example, or that they yes. married into each other's families. Precisely. So the, argument, the argument was for the sake of heaven, but it was all respectful and with dignity. Right. So that is radically different than what happened during the second temple period. Right. There are three or four, really four different groups. Someone mentioned the Sadducees earlier, the Pharisees, and these early Christians, these groups stopped marrying each other. These groups now thought of each other as different. And Akiva, and uh, not Akiva, Hillel and Shammai said, no, no, we can disagree, but we still need to live in community together. Wow, that's an important lesson that we all need to know. When we talk about modern Israel, <laughs> you can't like have a view that no one likes and then say, I'm taking my toys and walking out of the discussion. Hillel and Shammai say, you stay with it and you speak nicely to each other. Um, okay, so you'll see that um, by the year, from the year 170 to the year 200, Judah the prince puts these, Shisha Sidre Mishnah, puts the six 
uh, pieces of the Mishnah together. I want to ask you to study one Mishnah now in breakout rooms. I'm going to tell you what I'd love for you to do. This is not the first Mishnah you usually study. The first Mishnah you usually study is from Brachot, um, which is about lots of things, but Brachot meaning blessings. We will get to that as our last Mishnah for the evening. This is the Mishnah that as a student for nine years at Jewish Logical Seminary, it's the first Mishnah we teach. So this is the first Mishnah of Pirkei Avot. The questions that I have and the way that we often read Mishnah, first of all, you read it out loud and you read Talmud out loud. And we're lucky that we have the dots that you can read it in English or Hebrew. Um, so the first thing you do with your study partner or someone in the group is read it out loud. If someone wants to read it in Hebrew, great. There'll be names and things you know, even if you feel like you don't know a lot. And if you do know a lot, you'll know this. Or read it in English, but read it all the way through. Don't stop. And then go back and think about these questions in your group. Why is this the first Mishnah in our book of ethics? By the way, there's no Talmud on this book. There's other books, but no Talmud. Why does the line of, what does the line of transmission, you'll read it in this Mishnah, do here? And then at the very end, there's a teaching. Why is this the rabbi's first teaching? So I think you can do this in eight minutes, six minutes, is that okay? Six minutes, so we're going to break into groups. Does anyone have any questions first? Oh, okay. Where are we reading? This is on page three. It says, let's start. Number three, page three. So just so you know what the next half hour is, we're going to do this together. We're going to come back and coalesce all our learnings together because remember, Mishnah is about what we learn from each other. So like tonight I got to learn from Rob um, and put Levinas in this, which is beautiful. Um, then we're gonna do an exercise about what's in the Mishnah. Um, and then we're gonna go back and learn one more Mishnah and hopefully that'll be eight o'clock. But so you're gonna be randomly put into groups of how many, Suzanne? Three, four? Three to four. Three to four in your group. It doesn't matter if you know the person, but if you don't just say hello. And it's a great way to get to know each other too. And maybe read it in English and then start answering questions and see what you come up with. And then we'll come back in six minutes. Any questions first? So as we say at the Passover Seder, at, there's a section in the Haggadah that says, Se Omad, go and learn. <laughs> learn from me. This is nice.
Hi, Angela. Angela, hi. Can you you're, unmute yourself? <laughs> Take your time. It's good. It's okay. Um, you probably have to turn go back to the Zoom settings itself while you're doing this and increase your microphone. Now you're still muted. You're still muted, but but your mic might be up. There you go. Now try. Do you want to go out and try again? Because it'll say test your mic. Sorry, my lips are not, I'm not that good. At <laughs> Come back in. Oh, that's good. Hello, can you hear me now, Suzanne? Yay. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Well, in about 30 seconds, everybody's going to be coming back from breakout rooms. Thank for, you. To thank join you. the main discussion. Thank so, you. Um, so we can hang out now for another 20 seconds or so, and then we'll be back into breakout rooms later on. Thank you very much. I like your oh, red glasses. I like yours too. <laughs> How are you? Medium rare. I don't know you. Uh, we're new. Well, welcome. You, we won't let you be new for long. Oh, with COVID, every it's gonna everything's taking forever. So, yeah. Okay, so everybody's gonna come back in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How'd it go? I can't hear. It was great. Where's everyone else? They're, they're coming. Okay. Were you in a room? They should be. Hi, um, Angela. Sorry. No, your participants. Where did everybody go? I don't know. They all didn't leave. Well, they can all get back on, but I don't know what happened. I don't know where they are. They should be here. It says there's only three participants. It does. I see that. I don't know. Oh, my God. Ah, here they come. Oh. Did you have to get back on, Susan? No, I didn't let her in. So everybody's, they're, they're just, they're slow coming out of their rooms, I guess. There we are. Okay, who had fun? Raise your hand if you had fun. So, Tell me what you've learned, and we can all then learn together, and I'll go last. Why is this the first Mishnah? What's it doing here? Yeah, Ellen, jump right in. Well, we decided it was the first Mishnah because it was the first exposure we had to the Torah. So now that we had the Torah, now it's time to interpret it, for the rabbis to interpret it. Okay, great. Great, we're gonna build on that in a little bit. Um, Susan? It's, um, 
the realization that Jewish life has to be uh, reorganized no longer can it take place in in uh, Jerusalem and it's a realization that they are the, these men were the disciples uh, of the of the Torah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. We're gonna keep building on that. Anyone else? Well, it sets up everything. It it sets up first the basic Torah, then the then the prophets, and then from the prophets to the rabbis. I guess they're the men of the great assembly. So yeah. it, it kind of sets up everything that's actually given at Sinai. Well, it connects you to everything at Sinai. Yeah. However, it's a discontinuous moment. We're I'll go back and explain that after other people. This is a moment. It looks like it's a moment of continuity, but it is not. It is a moment of discontinuity. So but I, I had Neil but, and but Janet. I think, I oh, think maybe, it, I, I mean, I don't know, but I think maybe it shows the legitimacy of what they're doing. Yes, it does. Well, right. I mean, I think they're, this is establishing their bona fides. That, and, and I think that they're trying to hide that there's a discontinuity, quite frankly. Yes. They are trying to hide that. Okay, so historically, right? The temple's been destroyed 130 years before. The first temple, the people in my group heard this already. I'm sorry, I apologize. But you learn something after you hear it more than once. The watershed event of that generation is the destruction of the second temple, but it's not the temple that we're worried about. It's the culture around the temple. Who went to the temple? Every Jew, every Jew, Jews spent three times a year. That's where that's where business of the Jewish people took place. That's where the great court was. And now it's 130 years later. And unlike the first temple, which got rebuilt 70 years after it was destroyed, oh my gosh, they realized it's not getting rebuilt. And our temple culture was about bringing sacrifices, and it no longer exists. And our temporal culture was about being centered in Jerusalem in that one place. And it no longer exists. Judy, you wanna jump in and talk about how you described it? Oh, you're, you're, um, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Um, I got it, okay, thanks. How we went from Judaism being centered in bricks and mortar to sub to, <laughs> Foundations that were more um, that had to do with what was written, and the book itself became our foundation. Yes, so it was a reorganizing of Jewish culture. So, okay, before we go on, Neil Litt has something to jump in. Also, you're welcome to use the raise hand button if I don't see you, or just say something in the chat and I'll call on you. But, Neil, I think you're next. Uh, when in our smaller group, I, I related uh, how I learned this, which was from uh, Rabbi Mitch Jeffetz in Miami. Uh, okay. and, and the way he taught it was with a tennis ball. Okay. Uh, he would say, Moses received the Torah at Sinai, and he'd throw the tennis ball to the next person. And the next person transmitted it to Joshua by throwing the tennis ball. Well, somewhere along the line, somebody would drop the ball. This is the, this, there's a mixed message here. One is it's an authentication uh, that the Torah was transmitted from Moses and all of this was transmitted from, to, to, to Moses and from Moses and it's a continuous uh, transmission. But on the other hand, it's a very fragile one. And when we were talking about this, uh, Michael Leopold noted that um, that last statement, raise many disciples, that was what we needed for a solution. So if one dropped the ball, another one would pick it up. Rabbi, you're frozen. Can you see me now? Can you see me now? Okay. Yeah. Someone fix, hold on, I'm going to fix my Wi-Fi. I might.
you think after two years of this, it wouldn't be as awkward as it is right now. We're in the, we're in the phase where we're transitioning from a, a, a synagogue of bricks and mortar to Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> so. I think we. For our we've disciples. Two, we've got two Rabbi Marrows. My God, we, can we handle it? Have you all finished the next one? Where are you? <laughs> see me? We're waiting for you. Yeah, can you see me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. I it froze, so I just got out and got back in. Uh, okay, I have to un. I need to be on gallery. Yeah. All right. So, um, I was talking about Neil's story. What's the name of that rabbi? Because we should always say the name of Rabbi Mitch Jeffitz. Mitch Jeffitz, beautiful. So, um, I'm I'm gonna quote Heschel. Uh, Abraham Joshua, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel of Blessed Memory used to say that revelation and the passing down of the oral Torah was like a game of whisper down the lane. Mm -hmm. So what happens when your children or you played whisper down the lane? Okay. Kind of like playing telephone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Things get changed and things get convoluted. And if we say that the oral Torah, we, when we say oral Torah, we mean Mishnah and Talmud. If the classical Jews, Orthodox classical Jews say that was all given at Mount Sinai, then along the way, it probably got corrupted a little. You say from the tennis ball being dropped a little, I say from you know the game of telephone or whisper down the lane, it got transmitted maybe not perfectly. What these rabbis had to do here is they had to have authenticity. They needed this Mishnah. They needed to write that everything you and I are gonna learn in this Mishnah goes back to Moses getting it from Mount Sinai and then giving it to Joshua and to the elders and to the prophets and then to the men of the great assembly and then you should have many disciples like me, not me, like him, like Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, who's writing this. So this is about continuity with, Ju with Judaism and total discontinuity because they are, the elders are the Ziknei Ha'am. So they are like the, the people who helped, you know, in Parshat Yitro, there are gonna be people in every tribe that are appointed. The elders were the folks who ran the Jewish community, even at the time of the, the prophets as well. Were they the judges? Judges? Some were judges, yeah. And and also they don't mean this is not a this is a literary document. They don't mean specific people. We're writing this to say what we tell you now, you you students of ours, you disciples of ours, it all is connected to the Torah. It's all authentic. Even though they're about to say a crazy thing. Let me tell you this crazy thing these rabbis do. They say it's okay not to bring a sacrifice and instead you can pray from your heart. They totally recreate Judaism. And it's the Judaism you practice. It, that we still practice somewhat rabbinic Judaism. Okay, we know what the line of transmission does. Why might they choose these as their first uh, um, teachings. Be patient in the adjudication of justice. What's that about? Why is that their first statement, do you think? Well, it's it, hard. Law is hard. Yeah, Rob? I always read, perhaps not everybody reads it this way, the Talmud as, as struggling to, to keep the Jewish people together and to think through laws in a way that makes it makes as many people as possible legitimate. And so doing justice in a way that doesn't end up in retribution, doesn't end up in, in people getting divided is really, really hard. And, and so it has to be done thoughtfully. Beautiful. beautiful. So, you know, there's a great story that gets told often about Rabbi Soloveitchik, the preeminent rabbi, Orthodox rabbi of the 20th century. And, I just said Adin Steinsaltz, but it, 
This one's in America. Anyone ever study with Soloveitchik, Joseph Soloveitchik? Okay, so um, hold on, I just lost it. What did you just say? Sorry. Uh, I said something about doing justice in a way that avoids device, divisiveness. Ah, so the rabbi, sorry, I had the story. The rabbi has a young rabbi who's interning with him. This is a true story because lots of people tell it. It's a young rabbi that's interning with him and a poor old lady comes Friday afternoon with a chicken. You know the story? Some of you know the story, right? So with a chicken that has a blown lung, meaning there's a mark in the lung which makes the chicken not glot. That's what glot is. If you ever see a bakery that says glot, they're lying because glot actually means there's a puncture in the lung. And the young rabbi, you know, this old poor Jewish woman, what do I do? What do I do? And the intern rabbi turns to Rabbi Soloveitchik and says, well, obviously she can't eat it. And Soloveitchik says, find a way for her to be able to eat it figure it out, be patient with the law, make sure it works for people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the story is true, but I know that I've heard it from so many of Soloveitchik's teachers that I kind of believe it's true because um, it, it sounds like something he would say. Yes, be patient in justice because also they're setting up new court systems. There's no, great, there's no court system anymore. That used to sit in Jerusalem. Raise many disciples. The Asusiag la Torah, make a fence around the Torah. What's that about? So we thought that was about interpreting um, the Torah, that the Torah can be reinterpreted a lot, but also it's, it's creating a margin um, around the law so that you're less likely to break it. Right, you're less likely to break it. Why do you think they needed to say that? Yeah, Harriet and then Leslie. But Harriet, you are muted. No. Hello? No. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay so I started to say, um, we touched on this in our small group and um, I, I felt that we agreed the reason for this um, idea to make a fence around the Torah was to make it clear to the readers and the, um, the people who respected these laws that they were beginning with the Torah and there was no disagreement to be established by the writers of Pirkei Avot and yes. that they kept with them the very respect that the Torah commands of us. Yeah, I mean, certainly scholars believe this, what you just said, that this is about gaining authenticity for the new Judaism that they would be creating, this rabbinic Judaism. Leslie, and then we're going to move on. I may go to 805. Go ahead. Yeah, ma many of the commandments are, are rather vague. So I think there was a need to um, either explain it or, or, or you know, build the fence around it to make it clearer, um, almost I think what you were saying about the chicken, you know, kind of find a way of making something that might not be totally clear, uh, uh, more understandable. Yeah, so also they wanna make sure that now that we don't have a central place, there's no Vatican anymore. There's no central seat of religion to remind people, don't be willy nilly in how you interpret Jewish law. There will be disciples and they need to interpret it for us, with us. So what did you think of that Mishnah? Fun, interesting? And that's not even a complicated one. You could spend a long time on each one. I have a little exercise for you that I'd love you to do in the chat. What topics do you think are covered in the Mishnah? What are some kinds of topics that are covered in the Mishnah? And you can look at the pages that I gave you because I gave you all the orders of the Mishnah. By the way, in rabbinical school, actually as an undergrad, we had to learn the orders of the, all, all the names of the books in order. So I can only do them if I sing them because <laughs> Yeah. Um, Agricultural rules. Okay, I see Avi wrote Jewish dietary rules. 
you just said agriculture. What else? Purity girls. So personal purity. Yeah. Shabbos and the other Rules holidays. Rules of work on Shabbos. Bad holidays. What else? Prayer. So a prayer, good prayer instead of sacrifice. And yet there's lots of stuff about temple rules. Ah, who said that? Rob. Yes. As the, as the, as the Gemara has lots of stuff about uh, temple rules as, as um, Maimonides does, but not the Shulchan Aru. That's right. They read. At right. that point they, they say, all right, enough. We're not, we don't need the temple rules in this book. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That at some point, enough, but they take up a lot of time, a lot of time. By the way, there is an ultra, 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 ultra Orthodox yeshiva in the old city now where people, men, not people, men, sit and study all of the Gemara, all the rules of serving in the temple because they believe that the temple will be rebuilt and they will be ready to be able to do those sacrifices. Okay. So um, you have essentially, the one thing I didn't hear, I didn't hear one, one thing, I didn't hear tort law. Tort law? Yeah, you put it, Lee put it in, damages, right? All the other stuff that you're taking, going to like Judge Judy now or whoever, whatever little court you're going to, they have all those laws. All the laws about like, uh, you know, here's my, one of my favorite laws from Baba Metzia, favorite. This is how I describe it. You're not allowed to walk into an expensive dress store, ladies, or gentlemen to an expensive suit store and browse if you have no intention of buying, unless you tell the shopkeeper that you have no intention of buying, why? It's actually a great page in Baba Mitzi. I don't know if you guys, Neil, have done that page, but- Because you're stealing their time. Exactly. You're stealing their time. You're stealing their intellect. They're, they're, they may think now, call Ona Atzvarim. Yeah, it's, you're stealing from them. Okay, I know that I only have five minutes left. And with that, what I wanna do is, um, yes, Neil. So actually, if we can, I'm gonna have um, Suzanne ask her, can you save the chat from today? So we can use them next time. So now I wanna start with you in the right place, not the place of history, but in the place of the first Mishnah that you're supposed to learn. The first Mishnah in Mathakat Brachot, in Seder Moed. So Moed means times. So can everyone get that, that um, down and, um, I will tell you that one of my very good friends in, she, she went to high school with me or she was in youth group with me and then we went to college and rabbinical school together. And her favorite costume for Purim is that she would wear green, green top and blue jeans. You, you're all looking at me like, why, right? So there's a description in the Mishnah of when you can say the morning Shema. It's not the Shem, but we'll get there. And one of the answer is, in the morning you're allowed to say the Shema when it's light enough to tell the difference between green and blue. <laughs> so it's the second Mishnah. This is the first Mishnah. And what I'm gonna say, these are the questions I have for you. We're not gonna necessarily study them today. We're gonna begin with it next week, but I'm gonna ask the questions first and then have someone read through it. Why might this be the first Mishnah that we are all we are all taught to learn? What are the multiple opinions and what might the reasons for the difference of opinions be? And what are the larger lessons for the, from this Mishnah? So I'm gonna invite, um, I'm gonna invite someone to read it in English for us. And I try to uh, do breaks in the English. We're gonna just hear it. But I'm going to read a line or two of Hebrew so you can hear how it would be read in Hebrew. Matai Korinet Shma Barvit, Misha Shakonim Nichnesim Lechol, 
Rachamim bitrumatan. At sofa ashmura harishona, divre rebi eliezer. Vachamri, vachamim omrim. You heard like there's a lilt. When you study in the Hebrew, there's like, it's a kind of sing song lilt in your voice. Okay, who wants to read in English? The very first Mishnah people learn. The question is, why is this going to be the first Mishnah? Can I have a reader, please? Debbie, you're, if you're, if, yeah. okay, Judy Flightman, you're, you're jumping in, I see. I see. Well, nobody else did, but Debbie, if you want to read, go ahead. Bible says, is it Brachot, Berchot, 1 1, Seder Moed? Just, Berachot. Page right. 11. Brachot, 1 1. 1 1. Mm -hmm. that, okay. that is the book. The book is Brachot. And the order, the six, you know, there's six orders. It mm -hmm. fits into the category of Moed. Moed, like from the word Moadim for holidays. It means time. Okay. From when? Okay. Oh, wait, let me just say one thing about this translation that I have that I, it's part Sfari, part my own. Um, the bold is the actual words in the Mishnah. The rest are words that are kind of to help us. And so read with feeling. From really? when, from yeah. when, that is from what time? From when does one recite Shema in the evening? By the way, this is so great because now you can all go say the Shema later tonight and we can know if it's the right time or not. <laughs> okay, what are the answers? From the time when the priests enter to partake of their Truma, the food due to the priests, up until the end of the first watch. This is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. But the sages say until midnight. Rabban, Rabban Gamliel says until dawn. There was an incident where Rabbi Gamliel's sons returned very late from a wedding hall. They said to him, as they had been preoccupied with celebrating with the groom and bride, we did not recite Shema. And he said to them, if the dawn has not yet arrived, you are obligated to recite Shema. Since Rabban Gamliel's opinion disagreed with that of the rabbis, he explained to his sons that the rabbis actually agree with him and that it is not only with regard to the halakha of the recitation of Shema. The Jewish but, law, yeah. Right, the halakha, the Jewish law of the recitation of Shema, but rather wherever the sages say until midnight, the mitzvah is until dawn, may be performed until dawn. That's what they mean. Yeah, we're still in this one Mishnah, but remember the only part that's in the Mishnah is the bold. The rest of it we're filling in. Go ahead, because there's a little code going on here. Rabban Gamliel cites several cases in support of his claim, such as the burning of fats and limbs on the altar. You know what? Let's just go and do the bold. Okay. And? And all that are eaten for one day until dawn. If so, why did the sages say until midnight? This is in order to distance a person from transgression. So it's okay. a fence around the Torah, right? Fence around the Torah, you got it. So now tell me, why do we begin talking about when you can say the Shema at night? This is a thought question. I think, I think it has to do with uh, telling us that we need to be aware and cognizant of everything we do. So if you have to think about when you're going to say the Shema, you really have to be aware of it, the time and everything else. And that, that leads into everything else we do. So Michael, I agree with you, but they also could have said, make sure you don't, um, you know, make sure you wait six hours after you have your burger to have the ice cream. Why this? Why this topic? I agree with you, but, and, and there's more. Add on to it. You're, you are absolutely right. The rabbis are concerned with every moment of our day. Suzanne our, hand is out. Okay. Suzanne hand is out. Great. Okay. Suzanne, you going? Okay. My, my thought is because the Shema is the most seminal prayer in the, for us, that, and it's the first one that we're taught that the first um, th this has to center around 
our beginning. Yes. If Jewish days begin at night, which they do, then this is when we start tonight. Tonight's the first night. And you can say the Shema tonight. Tonight is when it begins. And this is the most important article of Jewish faith, our statement of monotheism. Okay, I'm going to go quickly around anyone who has their hands up, so Debbie and then Neil. So to me, it is talking about that decisions and understanding um, does not have to be so pointed and precise that there's a continuum in the thinking and that there's a, an ability to stretch and and understand in many ways. Yeah, I would. Um, I want to recommend a book to you that I'm reading again, and I want everyone to read it. It's just the best book. Um, it's by Rabbi Brad, Dr. Rabbi Brad Hirschfield. He's a rabbi at Klal. He has YU and JTS training, and it's called "You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right." You don't have to be wrong for me to be right. It, they're, they not, these rabbis, they're not wrong, all three of them. They should have different opinions. Neil. What's the Shema? The rabbis are, cre are inventing it right here. That's right. This is a statement of their authority. That's right. They are absolutely telling you in their very first Mishnah, you need to say our article of faith. By the way, how many times people are like, well, is there a litmus test for belief in the Jewish world? There kind of is. We don't really say that, but the rabbis here are saying that the most important thing is that you continue to remember Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu. The Lord our God, the Lord is run. This wasn't a practice before then. They are recreating what it means to live Jewishly. Today, we all know this is Jewish. And this is what defines Judaism. Okay, we're gonna just take one more round of anyone who wants to say anything, then I'm gonna do some homework and then we're gonna go. But yeah, Michael. So we see that on this saying the Shema, there are several opinions. So do they keep discussing until they get to one opinion or is there a chief referee who says, okay, I've heard everything. This is what we're gonna settle on. Or do they vote? I mean, how does it get down to us saying, okay, okay we'll go until midnight. Right. So usually, and this is a little bit more advanced, there are two speak. There's a ratio in a in a statement, the, the beginning of the statement and a seifa, the end of a statement. Usually we end up ruling by either majority or last one. Right. Because it's organized by Yehuda Hanasi, by Judah the Prince. And usually you go by last one. But you know, it'll get debated. It'll get debated when you go to Tal the Talmud and then it'll keep getting debated. And sometimes they come up, they, for this they do come up with an answer. All three are right. It's like, that's such a beautiful concept that there can be three rights. So all three are, are right in some way. There are sometimes, my favorite term, Neil, in the Talmud is teku. Teku. It means we don't know. And, it me and it's abbreviations for Elijah the prophet will come someday and tell us what the answer is. What a refreshing thing to have these great rabbis say, we don't know. So most things will get adjudicated, but not everything. Um, so I wanna stop for now and I want to just ask for your input, what you like about this, what you don't like. If you feel like you can't say that publicly, you can put it in the chat. Um, what I plan for next week is to have a variety of different Mishnas from different areas of, of all the six Seders to give you an introduction to what some of the different topics are. But then the week after and the week after, I'd like you to have the sense of accomplishment of what it means to study a whole chapter of Mishnah. So next week is more survey. And then the week after, and hopefully the week after is, let's be able to study a whole chapter. And then when you're done studying a, a whole chapter, you have a, a little party and a l'chaim. <laughs> you do, you have a seum. Always a reason to have a party, especially during a pandemic. So does anyone wanna say what worked for them, what didn't work for them? And if you don't want to, you can put it in the chat or email me later. Okay. I liked hearing the, the 
of others. Uh, some people have um, different different bits of information that I hadn't heard of, that I hadn't heard before, and it it uh, makes it a fuller uh, fuller explanation or understanding as far as I'm concerned. This is an organic process. We all put in a little piece and it grows right. and it becomes more than what we started with. Yes. Nice. Okay. I, I just want to say I, I like the format. I think you did a great job. Thank you. I think it's a difficult topic and I thought it was really an interesting class. So great. If you want to do some reading between now and next week, let me know. I can, what I will tell you is the, the I can give you a copy, a Xerox copy in my office of a book called Back to the Sources. And I'll, the, um, the chapter on Mishnah, I think, or Mishnah and Talmud is actually written by Rabbi Goldenberg. Alav HaShalom, who um, many people will be remembering. Uh, when is the class in his memory next week? First Sunday in February. First Sunday in February. So it's a, a magnificent book. Um, the back to the sources, but the paragraph, if you want like a deeper intro, the the chapter that Rabbi Golden, Dr. Rabbi Goldenberg wrote, I think the book is from the early eighties, but I'm happy to Xerox some that chapter for you. So I want to say- I, If I might ask um, if anybody also um, wants to um, <clears throat> try and extend this a little longer, you know, if everybody's comfortable going to 8.15, each night or a little bit longer, please also let Rabbi or me know. Um, it, I'm, I'm offering uh, Rabbi's time a little more, which is not fair, but if it's something that makes it all comfortable for everybody involved, um, I'm sure Rabbi would like to know that too. Yes, I was trying to follow the Zoom etiquette um, of, yeah, Lee, just send me an email. Um, the Zoom etiquette of trying to keep people on for not so much longer than an hour, uh, but hopefully next time, what we're going to do is the same thing. We'll go into breakout groups and study in Chavruta and then come back and discuss. Um, the etiquette doesn't provide for the interest of the people hearing you and what we're learning as well. I mean, you've got a captive audience here. So it's, uh, you know, we like this. It's interesting. And to go longer would not, I think I, I speak for people. I don't think that it would be, you know, nobody, nobody would mind. Okay. So we'll try maybe next time. Um, yes. So uh, Michelle Alpern, can you hold that book up again? Okay, it's yeah, thank you. Back to the sources, reading classic Jewish texts. And um, this of course is reading it from really a non-Orthodox perspective, or as we might say, a Wissenschaft perspective uh, with the historical school of understanding that you would learn this differently were you to be in an Orthodox yeshiva, but we're all learning the same text and it's all our text, we own this. We, the Jewish people, own the um, Mishnah and the Talmud. And um, one of my favorite things is to see Professor Dr. Uh, Rabbi uh, Judith uh, Hauptman, who used to be head of the Talmud department at JTS, on the subway with her little pocket Mishnah, because she would always be on the subway learning a couple of Mishnahs. So the, one, the other thing I like about Mishnah is if you go through all of Mishnah, you really get a, an eye into the rabbis and it's a little easier than, than, than starting off with Talmud. It gives you a deeper background. So um, I'm gonna get off and I'm gonna say um, blessings to all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, really email me or stop by the shul. I can make copies of that chapter. Lee suggested that I scan it. I'm happy, anyone who wants it, I'm happy to email it to you all. And please save the list of the Tanaim the list of where it says the Talmud Steinsaltz, which century, I will tell you that I have always hanging up when I'm learning a list of what rabbi lived in what year so that I can sort of understand if they're speaking to each other or they're speaking like that way. Thank you so much. I, this has been my favorite part of the week.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Um, the mic was off, but I just turned it on. Oh. I didn't realize it.